It is sort of as a distillation of a lot of things I've been saying. And sort of, I call it my manifesto uh, because I bring together a, a number of theses that I've been pushing into a sort of one book. And I, I realized that the series was called Disrupting Journalism, in which it occurs, a series of books called Disrupting Journalism in various ways. And I, I, I realized that the way to, to put my message, the best way to do it is to use the word disrupting. So every chapter has a disrupt, meaning there's a target that, uh, concept or view of journalism that I want to challenge. And then, I, and, and then in the second half of the chapter, I, I try to present my alternative to that. And so we get a sort of a dialogue going between these views. And so that's, so for me, it ranges from what I think the role of journalists should be uh, to uh, right up to, uh, to the digital, you know, fake news world, all of that. But it also includes my views on how that ties in with uh, the, the, so the global media that we have. And so, uh, so the last chapter is sort of putting it all together into sort of my big my view from 36,000 feet. Uh, I'm Stephen Ward. I'm a media ethicist. I'm retired from uh, academia, but I stay active writing books and giving talks and trying to support uh, good media out there, which as you know, is a crucial uh, thing to do right now. Um, it's not that my answers necessarily the ones you want to take home. <laughs> uh, my What I'm trying to do is to get ethicists and students and the general public to uh, to think deeper about journalism ethics, to challenge the traditional ideas that we've grown up with, which are really struggling right now. So I'm trying to pro provoke. It's a sort of a, I that's why I call it a manifesto. I'm trying to provoke people to think for themselves and to question some of the traditional ideas that have come down from the past. It would seem that this digital disruption is driving a lot of our conversation over the last two decades. Yes, De definitely. I say in the book uh, that the reason why we have disruption in media ethics is because we have and are undergoing an unprecedented media revolution. And the consequences of that are just are still being coming out. It was all about sharing. It was about, quote unquote, democratizing the media. You probably remember some of those phrases. And the optimism was nice. It was going to break down the control of media by uh, mainstream media. And it was all about participatory democracy. What could go wrong? <laughs> well, what could go wrong, of course, is that every technology has a dark and a positive side. And the dark side we've see is now unrolling through fake news and through, through uh, global disinformation. So we're, we've come to see that you know, words like sharing are not necessarily a good thing. It depends what you share and how you share it, right? And so, so my view now is that we're in, we're in a period now of, of, of really feeling very bad about this new media, and, and, and it's not even new anymore, but this, this whole new media revolution that we're in. And so what we need to do is get realistic about the media. There are very serious, what I call toxic elements in the public sphere now, and the problem is, is that given the global and digital nature of the media, it affects everyone, not just mainstream journalists at all. And so we need a coordinated social response and journalists need to be part of that response, which they're not used to doing. Journalists, because they believe in independence, their independence, worry about conflicts of interest or getting in bed with government or Facebook or with civic groups to fight this. But they're going to have to we as a society are going to have to come together uh, in, in ways that are way beyond journalism. The problem cannot be solved by journalists alone. It's far beyond newsrooms. The problem is whether citizens can take media literacy seriously, for example, and educate themselves. That's something that journalists can play a part in. We as journalists can go into schools. We can we can run our own schools and so on. Uh, but that has to go back to grade six or seven uh, here in Canada and elsewhere. My whole point is that this digital revolution uh, one of the greatest things for me intellectually, it's very exciting. It makes me rethink everything I've ever believed about the role of journalism. That also, though, can be frightening and scary uh, <laughs> when you see, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of trolls out there, the, the misinformation. So uh, I'm trying to I'm trying to, uh, you know, maintain a balance where I simply don't say, well, it's all just fake news and let's let's just give up on it. We certainly can't do that. I was going to say before you said it that a lot of local journalists I know here in Omaha are hesitant to engage in places, say, like Twitter because of the trolls. 
Very much so. I, and I'm not sure what if I'm not sure there's a technological fix for that. I mean, you know, could you put some sort of filters on your your computer so you don't get all this this mean and, and incredibly vicious stuff? I mean, I as a professor, I get it. I mean, no, here I am retired. What 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 do I matter, right? Uh, but when I put out a point of view uh, out there, I, I can expect to get some of the most vicious stuff, and I've learned to ignore it. But it makes you nervous, I'm sure, if you're a journalist, and journalists have been shot, of course, in newsrooms in the United States. Uh, what's coming down the line? Is this guy going to grab a gun and come and come after me, right? Uh, and and I think it's also scary that you're living in a, in a country where the ideology is so divided, uh, publics, and people become fanatical about their politics, that they, they would indeed think of, of injuring people that they, they disagree with, which was pro- perhaps unthinkable uh, a few decades ago. It would seem that the traditional ethical trajectory would be to look at, is there transparency here? Do we know interests? And here comes a Twitter account. That Twitter account is following nobody, has no followers, was just created, and they're coming after me. Yep. What's my ethical response there? Uh, your first your first ethical response is to yourself and your and your colleagues that you're working with for safety and security. I'm not a security expert, but I would think that all newsrooms nowadays have to have a really good uh, uh, security uh, plan and and how to not uh, you know help these people find out how to get into your building. I mean, it gets down to that that sort of that sort of uh, sort of craziness. But I think your ethical responsibility is is also not to let those people intimidate you into silence or to muting your criticism. And that's going to take courage. And we need courage more than ever in journalism right now. It's easy for me to say now that I'm I'm retired, but uh, you're going to have to put yourself, uh, continue to put yourself out there despite what, you know, people, I mean, I go off topic maybe a little bit. When I was working, it began in mainstream media. I was at the tail end when the internet was coming in, but before that, it wasn't. And we worked in newsrooms that were, were virtual black boxes to the public, and we didn't want them to be anything but black boxes. The public were out there. If they called in with a complaint about a story, was, we used to call them the crazies, or we used to call them uh, pain in the, in the butts. They were never treated with much with respect. It was, oh, somebody's complaining. We got to they're interfering with our job, uh, which is to, you know, one to many format. I get the news. I do it. I send it out to you. So don't get in the way by calling me and interfering, taking my time. The whole the whole model is different now. Right. Everything is about whether journalists can engage their audiences. And that means whether they'll survive economically, as you as you probably know. But not just that. But it's, I think it's just the nature of the media and the ethics right now. But the journalists I know, a lot of them don't get it. They don't get that engagement part. They think engaging the audience is promoting your content, is promoting your headline onto onto Facebook and so on, rather than allowing the people who are out there to start engaging you directly on the story, on the stories you do, a much more interactive sort of process. Uh, I don't know whether that's because of what I said, there's traditional notions of you have to stand back from the public. You don't insert yourself into the public debate. Uh, I think that's I, I think that's still there, and that's a, ma- a major reason, which is why in the book I talk about engaged journalists, is that we, we, we try to get away from the idea that there's two options on how to handle uh, Donald Trump or uh, fake news or this crazy, crazy ideological sphere out there. One, we sort of like go back, try to go back in time and just – report the facts and stress the notion that what objectivity is, is just reporting the fact, double down on the facts, stick with the facts, and less, you know, and so on. The other, the other view would be that I hear is that, well, no, we, we need to be almost partisan. We have to take a position against the president or, or uh, some, some entity out there. And so you're, you're sort of stuck between one and the other. I don't think either one is great. I don't think we can go back to just the facts, and I don't think reporters ever strictly did that anyway. Um, at the same time, to join the marching in the streets, to join the partisan uh, you know, uh, area for mainstream journalists would only give Trump and people like that more reason to point it out at journalists that what they say about them is true. Look. They're biased. <laughs> right? But, but yeah, so, when he yeah, claims yeah, right. when he yeah. claims the journalists are the enemy of the American people, yes. it would seem that journalism has to respond. It has to respond. 
but I shouldn't respond in what I think is a, as a as a uh, you know a, a partisan manner. What I mean by engagement is simply this: is that journalists have goals and they have duties to protect the public sphere and principles of free uh, press and free expression. You're damn right. If the president or anyone else comes after the First Amendment, they have every right to speak up. And they're not being unobjective at all. They're standing up for their goals. But in pursuing those goals, you can be or attempt to be impartial, factual, fair as possible. And so for me, objectivity is about the method. It's about the means by which we get to our goals. And so engagement means I'm engaged, meaning I have definite social goals for my journalism. I want democracy to win. I want democracy to flourish and so on and so forth. But that, you know, but in pursuing that, I'm not going to be a partisan, which means basically I'm going to push this particular claim or this particular view of the world, irregardless of other points of views and, and become an ideologue. That's where we really, where, you know, we shouldn't go. And there's a lot of writing on the internet. I'm not sure it's journalism, but there's so much writing who take perspectival journalism, which is really great for me. The, there's, for me, the, you know, the interpretive journalism is, is a fantastic uh, way to explain to people what's going on. But it becomes simply somebody uh, shouting at you uh, uh, their, their particular ideology. It would seem that the paradox of the Internet and now social media is that in those old days that you described, perhaps newsrooms were too cut off from the public, too insulated, and perhaps the problem which we, we were addressing at that time was access to media was a problem. Mm -hmm. And yet, at the other end of this, we have this new new paradigm and new set of issues. Mm -hmm. Is there a happy medium somewhere in the middle? <sighs> yes, I, <laughs> but it's going to take a lot of work. Uh, and I hate to tell you, we may not get there. <laughs> how's that for how's that for a, a, a qualified statement? Uh, I, I think there, the happy medium is 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 the those who practice journalism regularly and professionally are going to have to have to engage the public and show them what they do, how it is different from what other people do. And, and in fact, what are the standards and norms they use? It's really crucial. And they have to do that in a way that's really explicit. There's so much cynicism out there among the public that when journalists say, look, we, we're, we're, we've got the facts here, they'll go, yeah, yeah, no, you don't. You're just pushing your point of view. So you, there, this whole notion of engaging the, uh, the uh, audience has to be not just engaging them around stories, but engaging them how you did the story. And there are now, you know, there are a lot of uh, developments uh, that are improvements there. I mean, a lot of big organizations like the BBC uh, on to on to other organizations have 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 created tra transparency. Uh, you know how we put the story together, why we did what we did. So I think that's that's one you know one route uh, that you can take. On the other hand, you have this view. Well, if if you start saying you're for something, then you're subjective. Uh, yeah, I think that 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 has to be gotten. So what we need to do is to explain in our schools of journalism, and we need to teach this. That's the first step, is what is interpretive journalism? What is good perspectival journalism? Do we even have criteria? You know, it can't be that all interpretations are good as one another. It's not all just a matter of opinion. But we didn't develop those ethical classes, those ethical norms very, very much. If you look in journalism ethics historically, it's from the 1900s on, especially in Canada and the United States, it's all about how do you, it's facts, 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 good, and it's all, it's a policing action against interpretation of the police and no interpretation, get rid of that, be very careful. And, and, and if you're doing that, what you send the message is, is that interpretive journalism is all sort of just opinion. And it's, it's all the same. I remember working in newsrooms where we, the reporters, were the people who actually dealt with reality. We got the facts that were up. And then all those people in the big offices who wrote the columns and the editorials, well, they just spun subjectively on the facts that we dug up. That's a pretty that's a pretty bad view of, of what journalism is about, because I think good journalists, the best journalism today is between those those two, is the interpretively informed, terribly, terribly informed, uh, wonderfully informed journalists interpreting what's going on in front of them, but open and listening to other points of views. And that means a mindset. That means a totally a, a different mindset. That you that what I call pragmatic 
uh, objectivity or pragmatic rationality is basically simply saying that I, you know, that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm creating a view here of what I think is the importance and meaning of this event, but I'm doing it in, in a, a totally open way that I can change. This digital disruption is only just beginning in this sense. Augmented reality, chatbots, oh, yeah. the, the yes. technology, the Internet of Things, it yes. would seem yeah. that this is all even further blurring yeah. human yeah. nature. Yes, and it's going to make the ethics of journalism crazy for the next 20 years. Uh, there, What we need, the reason why, we not only need to re-examine principles like what does verification mean in a, in, in, in a media world that moves so quick that a uh, blink of an eye, uh, but we also, in addition to that, we need new norms, new content in ethics as to how do we deal with these, uh, how do we use these new tools responsibly, right? Uh, you know, even take, for ex example, uh, another problem uh, I think is not only just like fake news and what can you judge, but I find extremism an enormous issue right now. How do you cover far right or far left groups, uh, who, 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 uh, uh, groups that say incredibly false and undignified things about immigrants or racists or whatever without amplifying their sound, without amplifying their message. It's almost, it's, it's a real tough one ethically. And so At the foundation, though, does ethics provide us with something to hang on to, whether it be Judeo-Christian ethics, other ethical models yeah. that we can basically say, you know, the, the 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 tools are changing, but perhaps the rules are not that different. I think that um, media ethics does give you something to hang on to, uh, but there are different levels uh, of media ethics. At the media ethics does not stand on its own. Uh, the reason why it stands on certain social and political and and ethical principles that go beyond journalism. For example, why would I care about accuracy in journalism? Well, you could say because you care about truth. Well, why do you care about truth in journalism? Well, I care about truth because I want to inform the public. Why do you care about informing the public? And you go back, back, back in your, in your reasons, and you eventually get to, well, I believe in democracy. You get to a very solid political commitment. So you, And then you say, well, what type of democracy? And you can go on and on with this. But you're, you're, you are presuming in media ethics a certain social and political point of view. It could be religious. Uh, it could be religious based. For example, if I believe in my journals, I try to make sure that I respect everyone uh, as, as a person, as an individual, even while I'm, 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 I'm doing my stories. Perhaps your basis for that could be quite religious. It could be that you believe every person in, in the Christian tradition is, 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 is created in the image of God. And that, that is your, you know, your, your bedrock, your underlying motivation to do that in journalism. You know, uh, journalists probably feel a little queasy when you start mixing those levels together. You could say, well, hang on, some religions wouldn't let me report the way I do now because uh, they're authoritarian in, in, in structure. That, yeah, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying every, every point of view in media ethics it presumes something about the human nature of a human life about the nature of society. It is interesting that now with GDPR and, and Google, Facebook, and others conforming with that, that we are, in a sense, coming to group ourselves around the UN principle of human dignity. Yeah, and it's a good place to start. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, uh, what you have to think about, uh, ultimately what ethics is about, is what you think you really care about in this world. What is absolutely the most important things? That ethics is about the most basic norms of agreeing to them that allows for social cooperation, but also allows for human flourishing. So you've got to sit down at some point in your life and say, what are the things that really, really matter? And then those are my values. And then I start constructing an ethics from there. My, my moment of, of that was when I was in the field as a war reporter, watching uh, and, and reporting on really horrific um, uh, events. And what I realized that all these people who were once neighbors were now killing each other in, ge in genocidal fury. Actually, that in fact, w what we should be stressing is that we, as humans, we all have these basic needs. We all have these basic desires. We all have to, to grow and to flourish. And that is our commonality. And we shouldn't stop splitting ourselves up into groups and tribalism. And I think tribalism is huge, but that's a whole other topic. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's if, if you go to the nature of, uh, 
the value of just being a, a human person. Uh, you, you know, you can you can spin out a pretty good world or, or global ethic from there. Excuse me, at the core of this disruption, that it, yeah. it's already out there on Twitter. That's it, right. It's already out there in in, and, the, in and, the public and, sphere. And if you think if you think of journalism ethics as the responsible use of the freedom to publish, the word responsible so much hangs on that. How you define it in specific situations? What is it right? And so for me, it's always not just about publishing. We can publish. I mean, anything, we can do untold damage. And that's why we try not to do that. I mean, in Canada, we, courts have even decided, you know, that, that in fact, you cannot publish the name of, of someone charged with, you know, someone who's victim or parent victim, not even uh, the court cases uh, of, of sexual sexual assault, sexual harassment. And uh, so there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of balance. And I think in Canada, we're sort of sort of in the middle between a sort of a libertarian publish everything no matter what or WikiLeaks sort of <laughs> publish everything uh, and, uh, because you're so convinced that society is evil or institutions are evil. Uh, on the other side, there's uh, you know, a two soft approaches that, well, we don't want to offend anybody. And we're, we're, we're in the middle trying, trying to get, get the right to stop from it. I think that's right. I mean, I think in a host of ways, uh, people are always surprised when I name all the ways that good journalism newsrooms uh, don't publish everything and do do uh, edit a lot of what they do without censorship. I mean, for example, at major funerals here in Canada, I don't, you know, I'm just going to talk about Canada. <laughs> uh, the, 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 the big news organizations will group together and they'll pool stuff so you don't have a thousand uh, photographers as they come out of the church uh, crying uh, after the funeral. We do that with children, you know, we don't, uh, we take special care, and I, I, you know, and how we report on the vulnerable. We do all of that, but we don't do it. The problem now is that, is that there's so many people who don't give a damn about journalism ethics, who are not professional journalists, who don't feel responsibility, or they define responsibility in a completely different way. And so as a, as a mainstream journalist, you can be uh, righteous, <laughs> you can be ethical, uh, but the pressure now is that they're beating on you. They're beating you on all these stories, right? And is so, it, our, is it unfair to think of this as sort of the tabloidization of of mainstream oh, journalism? Yeah. But, but tabloidization with a capital T. I mean, this is way beyond even the tabs that we all grew up in and historically known. This is this is just. Um, I mean, it's just about anything out there that you really want to know. I mean, I don't know how you would keep even a picture or an image out. Off the off the internet, if if someone had it, uh, so the the big ethical what you need to do in a responsible newsroom is say to yourself, we're not going to play that game, we are not going to just follow the crowd, and we're going to get beat on a couple of stories, or we we may get we may not be the first all the time, but we better be uh, solid in accuracy. I, I think the best way for the mainstream media. Uh, to stand out is to not do that, is to follow uh, more respectable, responsible practices. And then they will stand out as different from the people who haven't, who, who don't have a care uh, about stuff or, you know, there's, there's so many examples of this, but uh, <laughs> that are flooding through my head. But um, the, the responsibility uh, is, 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 is so important and it's tougher. I mean, I, I understand the economic and, and pressure in newsrooms. Like if someone's, if something's going on on Twitter, you know, or on, online, are we just, are we not going to report on this? Well, the answer is you shouldn't. Uh, and there are, you know, there are other things you should be doing, like checking it out for yourself and, <laughs> and so on and so forth. I mean, it's not, it's not, it, it is not that speed of news and ethics are, are necessary diametrically against each other. I worked for a wire service where speed was everything when breaking news happened, but we had a, a very, very firm editorial policies that reduced the, the, uh, the, uh, the mistakes, reduced the errors that you get. Any yeah. ethical concerns that, that, that these startup companies that now have become such powerhouses in the public sphere may or may not have ethics in mind? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, my, my point in all of this is, is I often ask people, uh, who, who do you think are the, you know, name me a couple of big, who are the media barons, you know, uh, and often they'll talk about CNN, <laughs> Washington Post, uh, New York Times gets mentioned, blah, blah, blah. And I go, you know what? No, it's Facebook. It's Google. 
It's now Amazon. It's it's and do you know that these people are you know trillions of dollars market value and and, and all that, and they don't get it. First to say, well, you know, we're just out there playing on these things. I'm saying no, you don't know how much people's information is being channeled through those and their search engines and their algorithms. We we've seen time after time after time that their their statements that they were going to fix things didn't get fixed, and I'm not sure without much stricter and I don't want to talk about laws against media but there has to be some sort of very strong pressure put on these companies to uh, to not let uh, these abuses uh, and uh, happen and especially the use of our, of our personal data I mean does anybody really care anymore <laughs> about that fact that Facebook and these people have all this you know very uh, this intimate information on us sometimes I think people don't stop and think about how that can affect how we see the world and, and it does so I'm yeah I'm 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 I'm, I'm not equating Facebook with evil and being big with being evil. But if you're big, you really do need to respond to the uh, and, and in a real and tangible way to the concerns of, uh, of, of the people. My last comment would be is for people to understand that these problems of the media and journalism will not be fixed if we take a piecemeal approach. We fix, put a bandage on a problem here. We react to this problem over there. We have to rethink Everything right down to, uh, yes, the media's role in society, but we now have to include what is the media responsibilities of ordinary citizens, right? They're using media, they're sharing pornography, they're they're uh, bullying people, so on and so forth, or they're actually sharing stuff just because they think it's it's, it's really crazy. Uh, so I think uh, so. Part of us, uh, part of it has to be. It's no longer citizens, citizens can just complain about the bias of the of the mainstream news media they themselves have to look at themselves and what is going to be their media ethics and i call that media ethics for everyone and so that's that is the new one of the big stages that will be coming down the road and uh, we'll be teaching media ethics in the future not just in schools of communication schools of journalism but hopefully uh, all across the, the curriculum